Hello there, welcome to Inquiring Minds. My name is Doug and I'm back with another Pen Resurrection Sunday video. Never assume something to be easy because the moment you even think, oh, this is going to be an easy one, stuff will start to fall apart on you. Today's fountain pen resurrection is this beautiful green celluloid Esterbrook H from the 1940s. These lovely lever-filled fountain pens are among the easiest to restore. Usually all you need is a new ink sack and you're good to go. Even if you have one that has a damaged nib, Estabrook has made this H model and the more well-known J model pens with the easy to replace unscrewable nib assembly. So find another in the dizzying variety of nibs Estabrook made and you're back in business. And if you find a vintage Estabrook nib you really like, modern Estabrook makes an adapter to allow you to use your vintage nib in one of their modern Estabrook pens. But if you can't get your cap back on, well, you're out of luck. See what I mean? And watch this pen come back from the dead. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it! You're ignorant! Right now. I'm going to show you some of the video I shot while restoring this vintage 1940s Esterbrook H in green celluloid. Then I'll come back and show you the restored pen and do a writing sample. So here's today's cadaver on the slab. This is a 1940s Esterbrook J model. Still has the sticker on it. So I'll show you how to take that off. And let's take a look at its condition. The clip is loose and there's really nothing you can do about that because that's riveted in there. Uh, unless you want to completely rebuild all of that and I don't think the pen's worth that and the clip still works it's just got a little bit of a shimmy to it and it has a 2048 Esterbrook nib which is a fine flex and so we'll see how well that that nib behaves we'll see how it writes I haven't tried it yet of course this is completely unrestored condition the ebonite fee looks pretty good the section looks pretty good and without any heat Thank goodness, this section does come out. There we go. And we see what's typical, which is a an ossified sack. Now, it does have a little bit of spring to it, but that is solid hard right there. So I'm going to cut that off. I've got a new sack for it. Uh, this is the standard size for an Esterbrook J, which is a 16. So we'll cut that to length and put it on. Uh, so we're going to take that old ossified sack off of there. And because this is a Esterbrook J, the nib unit unscrews. And there's the nib unit itself. So we could exchange that for another vintage. Or even apparently modern ones fit in these vintage J pens. So there we got those pieces off. The pressure bar works very, very nicely. It doesn't show any signs of corrosion. And the barrel's in really, really good shape. Lots of scratches and wear, but no cracks. Same thing with the cap. No cracks. Lots of wear. So I think where we're going to start is by soaking this nib and seeing whether we can polish it up. And then we'll take this sack off of here and resack it with this new one. We'll polish up the cap in the barrel, get that sticker off of there, and see how well this pen comes back to life. So I've got the nib unit soaking right now, and let's see if we can break up this old ossified sack. We'll cut this off the section using my Pen BBS X-Acto blade holder. Put a slice in it and then you can just peel it right off just like that and we'll scrape off some of the extra shellac give this a little bit of a, a buff with some sandpaper to rough it up and then we'll polish up that section so I've polished up the nib cleaned it all off the metal polish on it and buffed it so it really shines there was a small burr on the 
top side of that nib, so I buff that off, and we'll see how well it writes. Now, a lot of people have the same problem as I have here with how to remove a sticker for something, all that sticky residue. And this works on most everything. Uh, there's a product called Goo Gone, or Goo Be Gone, that you can get in the grocery stores and the hardware stores. Uh, but it's uh, inflated by a thousand percent in terms of price uh, because it just has a nice orange smell. And all it is, is actually just naphtha, which you can get in Ronsonol lighter fluid. This is almost pure naphtha. And all you have to do is put a little bit of naphtha or Ronsonol lighter fluid on the sticker and it softens immediately and comes right off. If you get tape stuck to something and the sticky residue won't come off. Just a little bit of naphtha. You can buy it either pure naphtha or as in Ronsonol lighter fluid and it comes right off. Look at that. No smoking, no smoking while you're doing this. It's a public service announcement. No smoking while you're using lighter fluid. Well, don't get any on your clothes, sir. No. Uh, American moonshine. Don't smoke right after you drink Come it. On, honey, no, honey. no smoking. No smoking while you're drinking. And it just evaporates. You blow on it, and it's gone. And there's that Esterbrook imprint. Very nice. Now I'm going to go at this and polish out all of those scratches on the barrel and on the cap and we'll polish up that metal as well so here is the barrel before i polish it and it's got a lot of abrasions on it there's not many that are very deep there's a few right in there so i'll go at it with some micro mesh and see which level will to get that deepest scratch out and then we'll go up from there see there's quite a few abrasions along there. Yeah, I went at it with uh, with 1500 grit, coarse end of my chart, and you can see there are the abrasions that I, did, I didn't touch, and there's where I polished it with just a few strokes, and I got most of that out. So I'm going to go over the entire uh, barrel and cap with the 1500 and then work my way through the grits. And it's at this point that I really examine the cap carefully for any deep abrasions like that. Because at 1500 grit, if you don't get that out now, it'll never come out in the finer grades of micro mesh. So you got to get it out now. Now it's starting to come out, you can see right there. But I'm going to help it along a little just with a spot of 400 grit just on that little spot. See, it's still in there just very, very lightly. And it's gone. So now we'll polish the whole area with the 1500 grit again. And here is the barrel all polished up and the cap. And the section and nib. Now we'll resack it and put it together and see how it writes. So to figure out where to cut the sack, the sack needs to come to about there. So it means to take about, about a half an inch off. So about there. So I get my sack spreader out and we'll give it a try to see whether that length is appropriate. go there so I got it in and that seems to be working and then we'll get out our shellac and our talc and we'll do it permanently really difficult to do over the camera <sighs> damn it God! 
God damn it! Gosh darn it! Shit! Shoot! I'm gonna do it off camera. Oh, that was a tough one. Got it on there. I'm gonna put some more shellac on there again. And of course I got shellac all over the section, so I had to clean that up. Let that dry first. It popped off a couple of times after I even got it on. Just gonna leave that to dry. So I discovered something very interesting. When I put the section in the barrel and tried to close the cap, it wouldn't close. I closed the cap without the section and it closes fine. So I discovered that the top of the section was pressing against that cap liner. Somehow that cap liner is longer than it used to be and it doesn't move in there, it's very solid. And so I ended up not having any cap threads left for this to engage because the section was riding up against that cap liner before the threads could become engaged. So what I had to do was file down some of that celluloid to shorten the barrel slightly so that now when I put the section in, I'm gonna have to shellac it in place now, but now it actually engages those cap threads and the pen closes. It's not perfect, but it actually works. So now that I've shortened that, the cap goes on properly. I filed this section down so it would fit in the barrel a little bit better, but that does mean that I need to shellac that edge so that it freezes it in place and it doesn't rotate. There we go. I'll just let that dry just like that so it holds it in place. And here's the pen after resurrection. Esterbrook produced what they called the dollar pen between 1934 and 1942 in three sizes, full size B, slender A, and a demi version called H. They were made in a new celluloid material Esterbrook called pyrolin or pyrolin. Around 1943, Esterbrook introduced the new Model J, which had the Renew Point interchangeable nib unit where customers could choose a nib that suited their writing style and purpose from a selection of 33 different nibs, each with their own code stamped on the nib. The early Model J had a black plastic top finial with three grooves, like this one, and an Art Deco style clip with no branding on it, like this one. And that makes this Esterbrook fountain pen a bit of a head scratcher as it has a barrel with an imprint of Esterbrook H and a flat bottom with no plastic end finial, but has an Esterbrook J style cap. It might well be a Frank and Esty HJ. It could also be a transition from H to J around 1942 or 1943. It is in the Esterbrook H lighter green color called Foliage Green that came out later in the production of the H model and was also available through the J model. From the top we see the black plastic ribbed finial which is riveted to the cap and holds the clip in place. This three grooved clip has no branding on it. Later versions of the Model J had Esterbrook written right down the center of the clip. The clip is a little bit stiff but very usable and the cap has one cap ring with two grooves. The cap unscrews with one rotation and reveals the black ebonite section and the steel 2048 Esterbrook nib and black ebonite feed. The 2048 code represents the fine flexible nib on the Esterbrook chart and the nib unit unscrews easily for replacement. The barrel has an imprint that says R Esterbrook H and then there's a zero with a squiggly line and a dot and made in the USA. I have no clue about that circle, squiggly line and dot. And the inside of the cap shows a liner that helps seal the nib from evaporation. The cap posts deeply and securely and that cap weighs next to nothing so it doesn't unbalance the pen at all and it's very very comfortable in the hand to write with posted. I tend to write with it further up the barrel when it's posted and it's plenty long enough when you write down at the section for it to be written with unposted as well. Now let's look at some size comparisons. And here is the circa 1943-44 Esterbrook H slash J with a 1940s Eversharp Skyline, a 1946 Parker Vacuumatic Demi, a 1947 Parker 51 Demi, and a circa 1960 Esterbrook M2. Now let's look at them posted. And here they are posted. The Esterbrook M2 is a squeeze filler similar to the Parker Aerometric. 
and has a compatible nib to the HJ. This one is a 2668 or a medium. And I can see why these nibs are so cheap. There's no tipping on this nib like on the HJ, but unlike the HJ, this one here is a folded nib. That's when they take the steel tip and fold it back on itself to create the tip. You might be able to see that in profile, how that nib is turned back on itself. Now let's look at them unposted. The Demi Vacuumatic and Parker 51 Demi and the Esterbrook M2 have not been restored yet. And the Eversharp Skyline is FUBAR. Now let's look at some measurements and I'll be back with a writing sample. And we're back with the writing portion of the review. This is Claire Fontaine 90 GSM paper, and this is the circa 19, 40, let's say 43, 44, Esterbrook. H, and it has a number 2048 steel fine nib. This nib was in seriously rough shape. I'm unsure if all 2048 nibs came like this, but this was cut like a severe italic. There was a burr on the top edge of the nib as well that I ground out. But each edge of the tip of this nib was cut sharp and it was almost impossible to write with. I spent several hours adjusting the very bouncy tines to get them to align and then considerable time smoothing and rounding those sharp corners so the nib would write without tearing up the page. I'll draw a diagram here to show, that's the side view of the nib, and end on, it looked like this. All of these corners were sharp, every one of these edges were sharp, and actually the nib looked more like this. because I couldn't get these tines to align with each other. Once I got them aligned, then I cut these edges off so that it ended up looking more like a stub and on like that and more like that on the side view. See if I can close up on this nib so you can see, but perhaps you can see how that nib is now slightly rounded. And the result is the pen now writes and is actually very smooth. It writes a very fine line when you use a very light touch. Very important that this is a vintage flexible kind of a nib and that stainless steel is so thin on there that if you press it too hard it throws it out of alignment. So I recommend a very light touch on this nib with just a little bit of pressure. You get some really nice line variation. And the ink I'm using today is Waterman's, of course. But it's not Serenity. It is Inspired Blue. Which is a really nice teal kind of a turquoise ink. The line this nib makes is very variable with the thin horizontal strokes being roughly 0.2 millimeters. The vertical strokes come out about 0.7 millimeters. And if you give it a good push, it makes it up to 0.9 millimeters. So that's quite a uh, line variation right there. So that takes us from a western extra 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 fine at this end to a western double broad at this end or a Japanese extra extra fine at this end to off the scale. Japanese don't have anything like this. I'd say it's a triple broad Japanese. And for our quote
And for reverse braiding, well, I know for a fact I'm not going to even try it because it really doesn't do it and it's still very scratchy. And some quick writing. The feed has no difficulty keeping up, but again, you have to be gentle with this nib. So what are my thoughts on this resurrection? Well, this is proof that when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Well, not so much you, but definitely me. I was so familiar with this little green Esterbrook J when I bought it, that I thought, oh, this will be an easy fix. They're nothing like vacuumatics, a new sack, and you're ready to go. If the nib doesn't work, they're easy to get and swap it out. A little spit, a little polish, and we're done. I was so confident I missed the fact that this wasn't even an Esterbrook J, but an Esterbrook H, of which I had never heard of before. Then the cap would go on when the section was removed, but not when the section and the nib were in place. That had me scratching my head. And then the nib decided to give me fits when it took me hours longer than I expected to make it right. So, how do I spell hubris? I spell it D-O-U-G-I-D-I-O-T. What an idiot I've been! That's how. But at least I discovered what it is, or perhaps what it is. And I got it writing and the cap goes on securely again. So, success! This pen writes way too fine for my handwriting, but I'm sure there are Esterbrook J fans out there that would love this vintage pen, even though parts of it are an Esterbrook H. So I'm selling this pen for $80 US plus shipping. If you're interested in purchasing this pen, just write me at inkquiringminds at gmail.com. The first person to make a successful payment will get the pen. And there you have it. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notifications whenever a new video is posted. You can also join as a member of my channel for only 99 cents a month and I guarantee I'll answer your comments in the comment section and you'll get cool emojis, badges, and sneak peek unboxing videos as well. And that just leaves it for me to say, thank you for watching. And that's all she wrote. I made this.